Welcome back to another FPV Guy video. I'm Bo Lorenzen, the FPV Guy, and today I have with me John McBride. Did I say that right? Sounds good to me, John McBride. From Rocky Mountains Unmanned Systems. And he's down here in Los Angeles this week for a thermal class, learning more about taking thermal images. And what is unique about Rocky Mountains Unmanned Systems is they have shipped closer to 150 professional thermal systems already. So they are one of the big players in drone thermal. And John, you are really one of the people that actually know how this technology works. Mm -hmm. So let's, what, what are we going to talk about tonight is I have with me, the, of course, the Inspire. I love the Inspire. And I also, we have the XT here and we have a whole bunch of thermal cameras. Mm -hmm. This is what this is all about. Really good thermal cameras. But imagine I'm a local search and rescue kind of guy and I know I get a lot of emails from search and rescue people going, we must have thermal. I mean, I need to go rescue some people, save some lives. I need to have thermal. What is it I need to know about thermal? Probably the one of mo the most important things is that as we use thermal imaging and we pull that um, from a drone, is that th it isn't quite as easy as just put on a thermal camera. At, we've got things popping out out there that we can find people. It's really simple and easy. It's not. Um, there's a lot of dynamics that goes into understanding how the thermal works, what it, how we're going to get the best picture, how we set up the best. But for the most part, we want something quick and simple. Well, and easy some of the people that have watched my videos, they know because I picked this up last year, and the first thing I did was head out in the California desert and start trying to find myself and I was very disappointed when I disappeared. Sure. And then I realized, wait a minute, the ground temperature is exactly the same as my exactly. body temperature and so there's no magic here. No, there is no magic. The, the biggest thing is the way thermal works in 110% is that what we're trying to do is pick up the small uh, pieces of thermal temperature differences and that's what we're, what you end up seeing is the difference in, in thermal, the, the difference in temperature. You're, just because, again, a backfield of, say you're in the desert, it's 80 degrees out there. Well, if your body temperature is also 80 degrees as you're walking around out there or close to, close to it, it's not going to show a very big variance in the, in the output to you or the drone operator or the person doing the search and rescue. So this is a bit like in photography. Black and white stands out really good. Exactly. We need contrast in temperature. Yes, exactly. Contrast in temperature is exactly what we want. And and contrast in day or night, obviously these work in both, both versions. It doesn't matter during the day and it doesn't matter during the night. But succeeding with a search and rescue operation would probably be better at night simply because the rest of the world has cooled down where hopefully the subject that is lost is actually and That's what I discovered up. was because I went back out at 6 o'clock early next morning. Mm -hmm. The air was really cool and guess what? I was popping like crazy. So exactly. I was telling some of my friends that does search and rescue, I was like, if you're looking for somebody out in the desert, you need to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning with the thermal camera when you have a chance to actually get something. Sure. So we, we want that high contrast and that's what we're looking for for a search and rescue application. So anybody in, in any even trying to find a perp for a sheriff department or, or looking for cops or it, it, anybody like that needs that high contrast in, in the change of temperature. Um, again, operation now, can work both I day mean, and night. Perps so. often help you because you have that running, sweaty guy mm -hmm. hiding in the bushes and he just makes himself warmer and yeah. more visible to thermal. You're usually out trying to find a beer. That's, used, that's all he's trying to do. <laughs> well, Running with his gun and hiding <laughs> in the bushes, that's not where he's going to find his beers. Probably not. Probably not. But so, so what do we go about? We have this, and I always I like the Inspire because it's a reliable, easy to get to drone. Sure. Or do you, or do we need bigger equipment? Um, what's really nice about the uh, development of the Flare View Pro um, up into the what we now know the XT um, is their small size. So the size of them, as we get into this uh, and, and try to carry thermal, there was really much of the, the devices that we had back then are very large. So equipping this onto a simple UAS, I put them as... You're telling me the older thermal cameras were like 40 plus pounds. Yeah. And even guys, it was even 10 years ago, it's not even that long ago that thermal cameras were not very easy to move around. Also, they were very expensive. So even though we can still consider 
a Flear View 640. Put that up to the four thousand dollars. You know, we can still con consider that to be a four thousand dollar camera. Consider that this again was early dr drone adopters were running with fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollar machines, and now you can buy a Phantom for five hundred bucks. You can literally put and, this and little camera on something like one that. One thing that's really important to know about the Flear View is that this camera is eighty grams. Yes. So if you can fly a GoPro, you can actually fly a clear view thermal camera. Exactly. So being able to move it around is probably a really important thing. So, I mean, if you're just going to fix mount it, we have solutions in order to do a, a simple fix mount. Um, we created something that made it very easy to adapt to an Inspire. You can also adapt one to a uh, Phantom. So I, I can show you one of our, well, let's, our let's, systems I'm going to move your beer in the back here. Oh, so man, yours is on your side. Beer. And why don't I pick this up? And we have the so here is the entry level adapter. If you already in your department has a Inspire, then this is so the then this is the solution right here. This is the simplest solution. So um, there's there's many like it that have been developed in this way to be able to basically take a mount and mount it to the back of the Inspire as we show here. And once it's there, we can uh, we have independent power coming from the battery. On the side, we can then connect our um, basically video feed as well as the power that the FLIR view has to have. And then on the other side of the mount, we have a video transmitter that is again creating power to the to the uh, um, View Pro, and then transmitting it out on 5.8 standard video signal. Nothing major, nothing so you can crazy. Pick it up on one of the stock screens on the market with a built in diversity receiver. Exactly. You can use the diversity receiver, you can use a pair of Fat Shark goggles, you can use anything that can receive 5.8. This is independent, and this is really important. This is independent of the um, DJI's Inspire uh, video feed coming off of the, um, the uh, device or off of your uh, iP Apple iPads or anything. But it's really important because cops like this a lot, a lot better simply because this 5.8 can be shared to many devices, basically to the Black Pearl, to the video goggles, to any other ground stations that can be set up, and that image off of the FLIR can be, can be seen by any of them. So you're not stuck with just having to use just the So you can the have app. the drone team, which I know you were telling me a lot of the law enforcement agencies are now setting up drone crews. Yes. Or like drone squads, just like you have a K9, K9 unit. Exactly. They have drone units. So the drone unit can deploy this and then hand out screens yes. to other participants in an operation. Yep. Pretty much the same design that I came up with several, yeah. several years ago was being able to share that 5.8 uh, video feed. A lot easier to share than again any any of the uh, DJI video transmissions that are more difficult to share. It's not impossible, but it is making it more difficult to share. So having that thermal feed and having the operator uh, both telling the ground units that this is where we're going now, and seeing and looking at, they can see and visualize the same thing at the same time. Now, one thing that's important to keep in mind here, of course, and we, because we are talking about law enforcement, it is also possible for law enforcement to use frequencies that's only accessible to law enforcement, not just 5.8. That's correct. So, and, and it would be easy to modify a receiver by snapping on or velcroing a restricted frequency receiver to the back of that so that they have privacy. Yes, and that's really very important. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly unlikely that when the drone is in the air that you would be able to jump onto 5.8 because not, it will be realistic. There's not that many people that really are around in the neighborhoods to do it, but it's totally feasible. So we do want to try to secure that, that uh, broadcast. And that's possible. an option. That is an option. And I don't think search and rescue is really worried about keeping it a secret. Not so but much. But if you have a tactical operation, I can very much envision them wanting to use a private frequency. Yeah, absolutely. So, so we can, uh, we can, we can take this kit, we can adapt it to the and back. Then, we can, uh, how do you mount it to that? Uh, well, if we take this and we show here, Bo, on the back of the uh, my unit. My finger's stuck. That's all right. So, in a nutshell, we, we simply just take this plate off. I've seen other designs that actually clip on. They have others that kind of Velcro on. We wanted to try and secure this just a little bit better. So, 
we're going to take this plate off and we end up using these same four screws and when we line that up these line up with those screws and they're actually bolted on um, that way you don't have as much you have a little bit more security with right. it and then the camera just mounts by and then the camera the we just have a simple yep we just undo the collar and take that apart and we slide that on there if you wanted to because FLIR was pretty smart in this design is they used a GoPro type uh, con uh, connection here that's really so you, brilliant yeah so you can actually take this off which is really nice and we can see that there and we can then put a GoPro on the back end if that's what you wanted to do Probably so already got a, a camera on the front so well that's if you now, wanted <laughs> let's, we have so much hardware and toys here it's not even funny um, on the front here we have the XT but before we look at that why don't we take I know you have a two axis thermal gimbal right down here mm -hmm. So we're still going to hang on to the Inspire though, so so that we can see some of the mounts and what we've got going on. So so that's a pro mount I see there. Yes, it has the wide legs. It is. So we have a pro and, and the pro mount. mount can be put on an original Inspire. That is correct. So if you have an original Inspire, you can still use the system. Yes. In fact, the this kit will be provided with the pro mount. So if you don't have a pro mount, this will be provided with it. So. You will be included all of the stuff to connect on the pro mount if you don't have one. Uh, we decided to use the pro mount simply because of the weight. So as you can see, it's fairly large. It's not as big, you know, it's, it can be almost as big as an X5. And by the time you get the gimbal, you have the the motors and as well as all the cameras. We but, have but receiver. But that's a lot bigger than just a thermal camera. That is right. In fact, it's a lot more than just a thermal camera. So. Up on the front end here, if we look at that, we have a thermal camera that can be put in there. And the thermal camera was designed around using the View Pro. Any View Pro can be put in here. But if we rotate just a little bit, we can see the uh, what we would call an FPV camera, but we can consider this a daytime camera. So the daytime camera can be has a SD card on it. And as well, if you can see that, and then as well, the um, FLIR has an SD card on it. We start and stop those recording right on board, uh, and then we have stabilization through the thing. It is two axis, simply by design to keep the weight down. So we did we did we did consider doing a third axis, but just to keep well, the weight down. And personally, I kind of want to prevent the operators when they're flying from turning the camera 360, or much rather they turn the aircraft. It's true because it helps them maintain orientation, absolutely, and not have an accident because of loss of orientation for the pilot. Right. I don't think they're gonna notice. Uh, of the cut? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we're basically where we used to be and nobody. So if you haven't noticed yet, what just happened, we just got evicted from the hotel lobby. Apparently, we're not allowed to shoot videos in hotel lobbies, so with appreciation to the hotel manager, we have relocated to our room. Mm -hmm. I but, don't obviously have enough credential to say anything at all on who I am or what we do, so. Apparently, you don't stand a chance against or next to Britney Spears. No, don't stand a chance against Britney Spears. I can't believe that. I mean, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to thermal, you are my rock star. Well, there you go. And the hair. <laughs> the hair. So, you are about to tell us about this is integrated with an Inspire. Yeah, so we, in, again, intentionally made this to integrate with the Inspire. We included the um, X5 mount, which is included with the kit. Uh, the kit uh, will doesn't include the camera you you can add any view pro camera if you wanted to it doesn't include that but it does include our daytime camera a lot of people see this as an FPV camera but what's nice about this setup is that we are able to switch back and forth between thermal imaging as well as daytime imaging and and that then comes up on your iPad that is correct So you don't need an additional screen when you use this system that is correct so no additional screen is needed um, you can, you can see it on the iPad, and control systems are then, you know, done with a separate system. But in the most part, we, we did want to try and, and create something that uh, kind of fit into the market that was spe specialized to search and rescue um, our police friends as well as fire and, and utilize that daytime camera. So this is kind of that special design just and, for And that. of course, the reason this doesn't come with a thermal camera is because the view is available anywhere from about $1,500 to up to about $4,000. Correct. And with a whole series of different lenses. So depending on your application, you're gonna be choosing a different field of view lens and also a different frame rate and a different 
resolution on this system. Mm -hmm. And of course, the nine frames, and of course being cheap, the one I got was nine frames, mm -hmm. which really is plenty for search and rescue because you're just slowly moving over space and you're gonna see if there is a hotspot that you wanna take out. That's correct. And again, with the, this is actually a 720 HD um, camera that is transmitting back to the uh, application as well and is in conjunction with, so we can switch back and forth between those two video feeds. So if you see something that looks hot, you can switch and see, oh, that's a, exactly. a black box or something. Yeah, this, this field of view is a little bit different, you know, being able to use an FPV camera, depending on the, the lens on here, we actually have a, a 19 millimeter lens on here. And, that, and then, that's a, that's that's a very focus. small, oh. yeah, very small field of view. So switching back and forth between these two cameras would generate a, smaller shot with a, a wider angle shot with a more um, a, a center detail shot, detailed shot. Yeah. shot. Yep. So that, that is a, a nice feature that you can choose in either way. We did find that for the best matching is using a 9 millimeter uh, 640 on this or a 13 millimeter 336. Seems to be a good combination to match with the, uh, so, so you don't the FPV camera. Less disorientation when you exactly. switch back and forth. Yep. Exactly. So, so we have that, and let's let's go through the other camera we have here. Of course, is what was a big deal this year, and this is, as you can see, the completely integrated and stabilized XT camera, which is a thermal camera. And again, this is made and put out by DJI, but it's available again in the different frame rates and with the different lenses. Exactly. So we we actually at Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems have a video that does a comparison between the different images that actually come off of the thermal cameras that FLIR offers. So the different 336, the um, different lenses in that particular resolution, as well as the different lenses in the 640. So that comparison is no different, even though that we're using views for the test, isn't any different than what we see on the XT. So you can see Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems and go there and pull up a, an actual YouTube video that shows those and conver now comparisons. Now you're seeing a bit of the picture right here, but what we'll do is we'll put the link in the video description. So if you go down to the description, you'll find the link to that video and you can see what you see with the different camera options. Yep, so it, it, it does vary in price. So this is the big one, is that we're, we're in design, um, we're, FLIR decided to use and DJI decided to use a Tau 2. It's a very common uh, um, radiometric capable FLIR imaging camera or thermal imaging camera. And because it is radiometric, the cost of them are exceptionally more. So, so the the most of the things that we got radiometric for people like me that I just learned means that each pixel in the image has temperature data assigned to each pixel, not just for a particular spot. So you're able to later go in and go, how hot was that car engine? way over in the left corner. That's correct. And it will be able to tell you that. And with post analyzation as well as, you know, you're getting it in real time. The the biggest problem with a lot of the things with doing actual real temperature, real temperature is of course our distance away from the subject and additionally the atmosphere in between. So we can get really close but not maybe specifically a a specific temperature. We can get pretty close with it though. Something that FLIR is still working on, DJI is working on, but, and we're pretty excited about that development. So but but let's try to I mean this is this is ten thousand dollars right here. Ten thousand dollars. Roughly. Yeah, it's nine ninety nine ninety nine. That's nine, ten thousand as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> it's as close as it gets us for ten thousand without yeah. being ten. Yeah. Maybe they need a decimal point. Nine That's nine. right. But so, so this is ten thousand. What does that camera do versus the gimbal camera you were just showing? Um, so the biggest difference here is, is is again still a development that's coming along, but it's going to be there is the ability to do the radiometric data real time. So if so, you need radiometric right now, this is the ticket. Yes. But the other ones probably eventually is going to get there. Maybe. Yes. And the the biggest difference here that we want to really try to try to show is that. Even though the field of view, Why don't you the resolution, that for me again? absolutely, that went over there. So we, so we have the, and I actually like that this has a visual flight camera, in addition to thermal, and mm -hmm. you can switch it and see it on your iPad. Absolutely. But so with that, and if I grab, we have, I have a whole box of these right over on the other side. Yeah. So we basically have the three contenders right here. Now having a SAR or search and rescue department or PD, do I need radiometric? 
Uh, you do not. I mean that. We, I'm looking we, for a hot spot. We want Where a hot spot. We want that as we talked a little bit earlier about the difference in contrast between temperature and so I will tell looking you. Looking for a missing kit. I don't, I'm not using radiometric. I'm using the temperature difference. That's just the temperature difference, and, and and that will show up, which is much easier to see. If I'm inspecting air conditioning systems, photovoltaic installations in the desert and mm -hmm. stuff like that, then I need radiometric. If you, if the client is actually asking for the actual thermal temperature differences and wants to see that that is 190 degrees, as in a roof inspection per, for an example, and they want to show that the motor that is turning up on top of the roof is, is, is beyond limitations of its design and it, and it is signified by a temperature, yes, that's something that you would want. So inspection purposes, the XT is the ticket. That's right. You know. For search and rescue, I'm actually thinking I like the visual and the thermal together. Yeah. Because it gives me I can I can get regular colors and see what's going on, mm -hmm. and I can switch and see if that funny thing down there actually is a high, have a heat signature. That's right. And even to go lower in cost is just to be able to to do our earlier kit of just adding on a uh, thermal on thermal the onto any rig. You know, we just design and then one just have a separate screen and just a separate screen, and that's probably the least expensive as well as uh, what I would call for most of the departments dispensable. It's a dispensable amount. It's not too expensive if something crashes. Disappears, but I've seen a lot, lot of these problems. survive crashes. So even though they are expensive to get into your budget, they actually don't die that easily. Very robust. I will yeah. tell you that even I have seen and watched and whacked and hit and did. And it, they're very robust cameras. Um, literally, you have to you you have to slam them so hard to break the casing. Or these uh, lenses, as we can see, are actually made of geranium. So even breaking these this little teeny itty bitty teeny lens is kind of difficult. Um, yeah, and it's inside a metal collar. It is. I mean, I, I've had a couple of rough landings with mine, and on the, unless you're doing a mini quad raising you're probably not going to generate the kind of energy required to really destroy this. Exactly. Which is good being it's three to $4,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we will got, we, we, as we know, you know, the, um, most of the gimbals, as, as they, they don't survive crashes very well, most of the gimbals do not, but the camera but is definitely case, a robust here, camera. You can basically send that back to you and refit it with a fresh gimbal. That's right. But the expensive part, is still alive. Yep. Most of the time. And, and I, we have sent probably five or six cameras back to FLIR that have been serviced or fixed. Uh, there has been crashes, even the earlier Tau versions, they rip the boards or break the pieces, sensors wow. get broken. It does happen. I'm mean, going to say it's not going to happen, but it does happen. And FLIR does a really good job at, at repairing, fixing, and, and so making sure everything is recalibrated. Here, what kind of flight time do I get? Uh, for the, I'm sorry? When I stick this in the air for a search and rescue mission, what kind of flight time do I get? If we're talking about the XT, this isn't much heavier than the actual X3 gimbal. Okay. So your flight times are going to be very consistent with what an X3 flies. And the... The, what we call the Predator here, the Predator, it has about the same, um, we're only talking maybe 10% less in, in weight. Okay. But it's about the same weight as an X5, so even percentages of flight time, depending on and, how and you fly. And with a View Pro, then you can have live recording on both of these two. That's correct. Even though you're switching back and forth, you can later look at the card and see everything. Correct. Mm -hmm. so, Excellent. Yeah, SD cards, and we do that native on both of the what cameras. What is the rough price point on the Predator? The Predator. So <laughs> we're watching too many movies. <laughs> yeah, well... That was the consistent vote on what we were going to call it. So the predator it is. Uh, they start retail at twenty five hundred dollars for the kit. Add the, the camera. camera. Yep, you have to add the camera into the kit, but it includes a lot of different. So I should have units. a daytime plus thermal system for about five to six thousand dollars with a nice camera. In That's it. correct. Even the nicest camera, you can pick a twenty five hundred dollar the twenty five hundred dollar gimbal. Pick the Flareview Pro 640, which doesn't change too, price too much, but those are $3,600, and you can still be a lot less than, and have a daytime camera as well, and be a lot less than the XT, if you will, if well, you're not and, and needing I, radio metric data. The daytime data. camera is a big thing for me because I usually fly goggles. Mm -hmm. So this means I'm able to fly it, and somebody says switch or ONC, but I can still fly and operate this, whereas if you're have just that you may not want to do that exactly so mm -hmm. so this is 
for I would say for a tactical operation, the daytime is a big a big deal. It is a big deal, and it was a it was a specialized design just for that, so that we could incorporate the daytime camera into an Inspire. So. Well, I think we should wrap this up. I really appreciate you letting me hold all your toys, <laughs> yeah. and and like I said, John was down here for the thermal conference and for further education in thermal and I know we're gonna see some more and I get to play with some of these toys and shoot some videos so stay tuned I'm gonna shoot some videos that's just thermal and talk a little bit about what's going on and he's also gonna post some videos so in the description I'm gonna put some links up to John and to the website to the Rocky Mountain unmanned systems mm -hmm. and you guys are actually making it shorter just for people like me. That yeah, so yeah, we make it a little bit shorter to RMUS. So it's still Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems, but we can shorten it to RMUS.com. We can or shorten it to RMUS even on our emails. So it, <laughs> it makes life easier. It makes it a little bit easier. easier. So yeah. there you have it. Uh, stay tuned for some more videos. We've got more good stuff coming up. And this is John McBride, and I'm Bo Lawrenson, the FPV guy. So stay tuned, subscribe, and also I'm going to put a link right up here or right down here or something right now. Click through if you want to subscribe to Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems video channel where you will be able to get more of the stuff and the information stuff and educational stuff John is uploading. So stay tuned for those things, and we're sorry about the change of venue here. We'll be back with more video. Uh, we'll be at the next concert next week. Make sure that you join us. <laughs> what I really want to know is where did our beers go? Oh, did we leave them down there? We did leave them oh, down there. Did.